It's eight o'clock. This is the UK Tonight. We start with breaking news. As Hamas says, it has released two more Israeli hostages. We'll have an exclusive interview with a senior Hamas leader who tells Sky News that more civilians will be freed if the bombardment of Gaza ends. If Netanyahu was keen on their safety, if the Europeans and the Americans are keen on their safety, let them force Israel to stop its aggression, to stop this genocide. Here, the Prime Minister announces more aid for Gaza and says the explosion of a hospital last week was likely caused by a missile launched from within the territory. And the head of the Metropolitan Police defends his officers after a man who chanted jihad during a rally in London at the weekend escaped arrest. Well, ministers say it was incitement to violence, but police say no offence was committed. We'll discuss the gaps in the law. Also ahead tonight, counting the cost of Storm Babette. Thousands of people have been hit by flooding and there could be more to come. I'm going to speak to some of those affected. As the government delays the ban on no-fault evictions, I'll bring you Laz's story. She's just one of 380,000 people caught in the hidden homelessness crisis. I've always done what I needed to do to keep myself in a home. I never saw this happening to me, and especially not so quickly. And then when it does, it just knocks you for sex. And a blight on our community is the new plan to tackle shoplifting. But will it work? Well, that's come and much more on The UK Tonight. Hello. Well, we start this evening with an exclusive interview with a senior Hamas leader who says Israeli hostages will be released if the bombardment of Gaza ends. Tonight, Hamas has claimed that two more hostages have been freed for, they say, humanitarian reasons after mediation by Egypt and Qatar. Israeli TV has also reported this news and says their families have been notified. Around 200 Israelis are still reportedly being held by Hamas inside Gaza. Uh, today, Khaled Mashal, the former head of Hamas, told Sky News that 22 hostages have been killed in Israeli airstrikes. But he says the remaining civilians will be released if the right conditions are met. He was speaking to our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, in Doha. Will you release all the civilian hostages? Will you let them go from Gaza? Unconditionally, will you let them out now? Oh, well, they are not hostages, first. Secondly, I told you. Whatever you call them, captives, oh, guests, oh, 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 oh. whatever. Will you let them go? What have they Don't done? Them. Don't them. I said we will release them, and the Al-Qassam brigades announced that. But now they are distributed in different locations. Israel has killed more than 22 of them because of the destruction it has caused. So therefore, if Netanyahu was keen on their safety, if the Europeans and the Americans are keen on their safety, let them force Israel to stop its aggression, to stop this genocide, this brutal war crimes which are committed every day. Yesterday, only 400 victims in one night, Dominic. Let them stop this aggression and you will find the mediators like Qatar and some Arab countries like Egypt and others, they'll find a way to have them released and we'll send them to their homes. Palestinian journalists have filmed Hamas fighters going to civilian places, attacking civilians. I'm asking you, please answer. Was that intended? Was it calculated? Or was it a mistake? Did your men go too far that day? I'm telling you very specifically, the elite forces of Al-Qassam did not kill civilians with the admission of Israeli women in the Israeli media as a result of the fire exchange and by the bullets of the Israelis. Hamas bandanas, they're in kibbutzes, civilian places, looking for civilians. Let me finish my sentence, please. If there was any killing, this definitely was not intended, definitely. Now, that exclusive interview there with Dominic Waghorn. Uh, let's join our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle now, who is in Jerusalem tonight. And, Alistair, the breaking news, uh, two hostages released by Hamas. This is also being confirmed by uh, Israeli TV tonight. Uh, on humanitarian grounds, uh, we understand, according to Hamas. What more do we know at this stage? 
uh, two female captives uh, of Hamas. We don't know their nationalities yet. We don't know their identities. Or we can't confirm their identities yet. But Hamas is saying they're releasing them because of poor health. Um, we think they might be now in the care of the International Red Cross. Uh, that would make sense because uh, you remember a few days ago, two American hostages were released, a mother and daughter. And when we saw the video that was taken by Hamas, masked gunmen uh, taking them to the Gaza border, and they were they were they were met by representatives from the Red Cross who are sort of acting as sort of neutral arbiters in, in, in this um, process at the moment. And then they took them and then handed them over to the Israeli Defence Forces. Now, what we can say is more broadly, um, there has been a mediation process led primarily by Qatar, who have a direct link to Hamas because the Hamas, uh, or many of them Hamas political leadership, are based in Doha. I mean, that's where Dominic did that interview that you just saw. And so it gives Qatar the ability to be able to speak directly, face to face, if necessary, with Hamas. The United States and others are supporting it. If two people have been released tonight, uh, that is very, very good news. And it comes off the back of two others released a few days ago. But the Israeli military updated their figures for the estimated number of hostages in Gaza today to 222. So that would leave 220 still in there. I mean, it's a massive hostage crisis still facing the Israelis, and it's a multinational hostage crisis. And um, people will say that this is a cynical ploy by Hamas to release a couple of hostages every few days in an attempt, maybe, to prevent the Israeli military going in on the ground. Alistair, thank you. Uh, we're just getting a bit more news in. We're, uh, this is coming from Egypt's state news agency, uh, who are saying that the two Israeli captives uh, released this evening by Hamas have arrived at the Rafa crossing, the Rafa crossing, of course, going from Gaza into Egypt. But that's coming from Egypt's state news agency, saying the two Israeli hostages released tonight by Hamas have arrived at the Rafa crossing. We'll keep you across developments as and when we get them here at Sky News. Uh, and just before we were talking to Alistair, uh, we brought you some of Dominic Waghorn's interview with Khaled Mashal. Uh, you can see it in full. That's coming up in our special programme at nine o'clock tonight. Well, tonight's claims from Hamas that 22 hostages have been killed in airstrikes come as Israel steps up its search for those being held in Gaza. Raids have taken place inside the territory and there has been no let-up in the intense bombing. Well, all eyes are now on the Israel Defence Forces with huge numbers of troops gathering in southern Israel. Our chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey reports from the town of Nebriot near the Gaza border. In the southern desert, the military build-up has been virtually continuous for the best part of two weeks now. Rocket systems are being moved into position. These ferocious weapons can fire multiple warheads in seconds. Much of southern Israel and all the land bordering Gaza are closed military zones. Israeli soldiers are operating in Gaza already, but on specially identified missions. The plans are in place, though, for a full incursion. In artillery positions, the soldiers wait in place for their next orders. These are tanks with their turrets taken off. They'll be used to carry troops because the armour is so much stronger than normal carriers. So the military is ready. But the hostages in Gaza are a real problem for the Israeli government. Even before the dangers of any would-be rescue attempt, the hostages, of course, have to survive this. This is the Israeli Defence Force's latest video showing attacks in Gaza, which they say show strikes on the operational infrastructure of Hamas. Those are entire buildings reduced to rubble. Israelis we've talked to broadly believe a major move into Gaza is both necessary and inevitable. But there are divisions here over timings and whether it should wait for a potential hostage release. Businessman Eden Mano is convinced the military operation should begin right away, regardless of the fate of the hostages. I think we need this operation, we need to go inside, we need to rescue as many hostages as possible, and we need to eliminate Hamas. 
This is the price of war. Unfortunately, this time we're paying with innocent civilians' lives. Olga Entel, who lives in a kibbutz with her husband and three children, has only just left her home for the first time in 17 days. Her inclination is for a delay. How do people feel about those people who are inside? Is it really the, should, it's the most important thing, getting them out? Uh, I believe most of us uh, believe in that, yes. But, uh, you know, I cannot uh, think what is right or what is wrong. It's not uh, my... Uh, uh, it's not in my power to decide, and I just want everyone to be safe. In the north of Israel, the road towards Lebanon is closed to all but the military. Major towns are virtually deserted now. Mandatory evacuation orders have been imposed. The threat from Hezbollah rockets in Lebanon is arguably greater than anything emanating from Gaza. Israelis are in a sort of limbo, waiting for attacks, waiting for an invasion and waiting for the hostages. Stuart Ramsey, Sky News, Israel. The Prime Minister Rishi Sunak addressed the Commons this afternoon to update MPs on his visit to the Middle East last week. Sunak pledged another £20 million in humanitarian aid for civilians in Gaza and he said that the explosion at the al Ahli hospital last week was likely caused by a missile launch from within the territory. On the basis of the deep knowledge and analysis of our intelligence and weapons experts, the British government judges that the explosion was likely caused by a missile or part of one that was launched from within Gaza towards Israel. The misreporting of this incident had a negative effect in the region, including on a vital US diplomatic effort and on tensions here at home. We'll have more on the Israel-Hamas war and its impact in the UK a little later in the programme, including uh, calls for police to be given more powers. Uh, this is after a man escaped arrest despite chanting jihad during a rally in London on Saturday. Now, police Scotland say the body of a man has been recovered from a van that became trapped in flood water near Merrikirk in Aberdeenshire. It takes a number of people that have been killed in Storm Babette across the UK to seven. Earlier, man, earlier a man who died in Forfar was named as 56-year-old John Gillen. Well, Mr Gillen, who was from Arbroath, was killed after a tree struck his van. His family described him as a loving husband, father, father-in-law and grandfather. Uh, well, of course, Scotland suffered the most extreme weather during the storm, but there was widespread damage across the UK. The Environment Secretary visiting Retford in Nottinghamshire today to see the scale of the damage there. And while she was there, Therese Coffey was challenged by residents. Yeah, please go inside to help yourself. Okay, all right. Everybody else has, and it's, it's not a home anymore, it's just a shell of okay. water. And... So, what do you think? Yeah, I can imagine it's very. You're going to ask me what I think. Please don't, because... No, no, I, I, look, it's very upsetting, I know. I have no personal experience of the impact of this. It flooded exactly the same as it did okay. before, up here, over to Meaden, and then everywhere just flooded yeah. around here. And we were just we just left again. This is again, this has happened, just left to his own devices. Well, I've come today. I know um, you have. Brendan and... invited me to come up, um, understanding the impact, particularly because of some of the... Uh, timeliness of the warnings. Oh, well, I'm joined now by pub landlord Jamie Rawson, who had to escape through a top floor window after his cellar was flooded floor to ceiling, which meant the doors were stuck and there was no way out. And Jamie, thank you so much for joining us here on the UK tonight. Um, first, to me, first, talk to me about the, the scale of damage at your pub. What are you left with? Uh, we won't be open for weeks, maybe months. Uh, the entire cellar was underwater. All our serving equipment is wrecked. Our commercial kitchen is wrecked. Uh, carpets are ruined. Toilets are ruined. It's just a nightmare. We don't know when we'll recover from this. Um, Jamie, and I understand that you haven't got insurance because this has happened before. You're at risk of flooding. So this is... 
this is really not good news. This is the worst possible outcome for you and your business. Yeah, the same thing happened in 2007 in Chesterfield in the exact same places. And it's happened again, but worse this time. So myself, like many other businesses, would like to know really what did Chesterfield Borough Council or Derbyshire County Council do between 2007 to now to stop this from happening? Because it feels like nothing's happened, to be honest. And, and once again, we've just been left with to clean up by ourselves. I've heard from nobody from either councils. Mm. Yeah, Jamie, you say it feels like nothing has happened and obviously our viewers are, are looking at the images on the screen and you know, it's pretty hard to, to comprehend if that were to happen you know, to, to their businesses or their homes. It's utterly devastating. Were you forewarned by the council? What kind of practical help were you given? Because as you said, this had happened before. Uh, no, absolutely no warning at all. My warning was... Uh, Myself and my sister waking up uh, to taking our beer delivery at 10 a.m. on Friday morning and noticing our cellar was starting to flood. And then me going up to the river to see that extremely high, uh, the drainage system's backing up, and by one o'clock, I'm completely underwater. Jamie, what now? Have you heard from the council since? Uh, no, not at all, no. Nothing at all? Have you tried? Presumably, you have. Uh, no, no, because I'm just trying to, luckily, myself, staff, friends, family, volunteers have all been coming to try and clean up the pub, get rid of debris, sludge, uh, fix items. I've had electricians uh, all volunteering their time completely for free. Yeah, Jamie, I get it. It's, you know, it's all hands on deck, isn't it? Because, you know, this is your livelihood, mm. also your home, and we know that pubs are the hub of the community and it mm. won't just be you that's been affected by this talk to me about the community around you people's homes and other businesses what have you been seeing what have you been discussing amongst yourselves about what's happened uh we just can't believe it's happened again uh, all, all the businesses on the street all the residents on the street i mean before i had the pub i lived in a house just down the road if i still if i still live there my house would also be flooded again uh, it's affected everybody and everyone's tried to pull together. I mean, Chesterfield and Brampton and Chatsworth Road are a close-knit community. We've all been helping each other with cleaning supplies and, and anything we can. I've had people turn up and bring us all hot food. I've had no power. I, I, I didn't have power until four o'clock today and that's since Friday. I mean, Jamie, talk to me about what's going to be hap happening in the next few days. As you said, you family and friends have been at the pub trying to clean up as much as you can. From what we gather, you know, Storm Babette has had this effect, but there's more rain on the way. Yeah, it's something we're all really concerned about, and I'd love to know if the council are going to do anything between now and when this rain's due, or is it just going to happen again? I mean, last thing I need to do is replace all my cellar equipment, kitchen equipment. This is going to happen again in the next couple of weeks. I'm already thousands of pounds down in revenue from being closed for a couple of days without trying to replace all my equipment for tapping again and again and again. I mean, Jamie, let's face it, it's a tough enough time for the hospitality industry as it is. Absolutely. Let's get real about the effects of, of what's happening to you. I mean, we're hoping to hear from a gentleman in Brecon whose business has been similarly affected to yours, who started a crowdfunding page because he's saying, you know, this is the end of his business unless he gets a bit of help, because again, not getting anything from, from local authority. What steps are you going to take next to, to keep going? I mean, I think luckily um, being supported quite well from our local suppliers uh, and friends and family. I, I, I honestly don't know what will happen next, but I'm just going to keep kind of ploughing on and, and see if we can get reopened as soon as possible. I mean, there's nothing else I can do. I mean... It's one thing to start a crowdfunding, but everyone else is also going through a cost of living crisis. So mm. it's what everyone's trying their best, really. Yeah, Jamie, you talked about your pub, you talked about, you know, your immediate community, but just how, give us an idea of just how bad Chesterfield was affected. What are you looking at when you step outside your pub and walk around, wade around? Oh, there's, there's abandoned cars still uh, everywhere. Uh, there's just, you know, mud and sludge everywhere. And, and there's still, the river's still quite high now. There's still places without power. There's still residents without power. 
it still just seems like the council, the local authority, doing far too little, far too late. I mean, uh, my sister's car is still outside the pub. That got flooded and that's still, still been abandoned. No one's come for that yet or checked on us or anything like that. Uh, we had today another another pub in the area offered to lend us a car for now. Uh, there just seems to be no help uh, for anybody around here currently. It's just we're all helping each other. Well, look, Jamie, you're all rallying together. Uh, hopefully somebody uh, at the local authority will get to see this interview tonight because, as you've said, so many in your position, this is people's homes, this is people's businesses, and... Um, you're in a desperate state tonight. Um, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on to tell us your story. I know it's pretty difficult what you're going through right now, but I know you want to speak out because, as I've said, so many other people are going through exactly what you're going through. That's Jamie Rawson, um, a pub landlord in Chesterfield. Jamie, thank you. Thank you. Well, still to come on the UK tonight, getting tough on shoplifters. Details of the government's new action plan, which is aimed at protecting retailers' profits and their workers. And a man is arrested over that massive fire at Luton Airport. You'll remember this one. It destroyed up to 1,500 cars at Luton Airport car park. We've got your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. Stage, the film and TV podcast. Welcome back. You're watching the UK tonight. Here's what's on the way. We're going to discuss hidden homelessness. It affects 380,000 people here in the UK. Laz is one of them. We'll bring you her story shortly. And there's a reason to celebrate for the former Scottish First Minister. We'll tell you about Nicola Sturgeon's new role. OK, let's take a look at some of the other stories making news in the UK tonight. A man who shot and killed his daughter's ex-partner and his father has been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. Stephen Alderton shot Joshua Dunmore two days after a court hearing into whether his daughter would be able to take the ex-couple's daughter to live in the United States. Joshua Dunmore's father, Gary Dunmore, was killed in a separate incident six miles away. The judge described the double murder as an execution. 
by someone who had taken the law into his own hands. A man in his 30s has been arrested over that massive fire at Luton Airport that caused a car park to collapse. Well, the fire led to delays and cancellations for thousands of passengers, while as many as 1,500 cars remain trapped inside the car park. and They are unlikely to be salvageable. The man was arrested on suspicion of criminal damage and has been released on bail. Investigations so far suggest that the fire was caused by a fault in a diesel vehicle. Researchers say a change in the use of existing treatments for cervical cancer could lead to a 35% reduction in the risk of death or the cancer returning. University College London's Cancer Institute found that a short course of induction chemotherapy immediately before standard radiotherapy helped reduce rates of relapse and death by more than a third. It's been hailed as the biggest breakthrough in the treatment of the disease for 20 years. A blight on our communities. Those are the words of the Crime and Policing Minister today, uh, the words used to describe shoplifting. He has set out a new plan which he hopes will protect retailers' profits and their staff. But do shopkeepers have any confidence that this new plan will work? Our chief North of England correspondent, Greg Milan, reports. A thousand times a day, this is what's going on somewhere in Britain. A shoplifter helping himself from the shelves of the co-op before just walking out. Time and again, the security cameras like those at this shop near Manchester capture staff dealing with what they say is an epidemic. We're not seeing people steal for their own needs. We're st seeing people steal on scale to resell. My colleagues every day will face abuse, they'll face sometimes violence, and they'll see people coming in to ransack the stores. Many of my colleagues are afraid, and certainly we are seeing people leave the retail sector because of it. It's got so bad that products like this, a leg of pork costing seven pounds, is now protected by a GPS tracker. Other products they don't even put out on the shelves anymore. They're stolen so often. And retailers say we need to start calling this what it is, not shoplifting, but looting. But measures like this can only go so far when staff are facing this. The companies say the police haven't taken shoplifting seriously enough until now. The big retailers went to Downing Street for a meeting with police and ministers. It's a crime that we take extremely seriously. It's something the government is extremely concerned about. The result, a police commitment to turn up when shoplifters are violent or when security guards catch them. They'll target known hotspots and use facial recognition technology. In the last few months, there has been a specific spike in shoplifting, and we are determined to take a zero-tolerance approach to that, to clamp down on it hard, to avoid any escalation. And today's police action plan, launched with the Home Office, is designed to do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There'll also be a new police unit to target the organised crime gangs believed to be behind much of this. It'll be paid for, in part, by the businesses. The action plan's been welcomed by retailers, but they know better than most that old saying about the proof of the pudding. Greg Milam, Sky News, Cheshire. And let's just bring you some breaking news uh, with regard to the hostages that have been released by Hamas tonight. Uh, we are hearing that uh, the Red Cross has facilitated the release of these two hostages out of Gaza tonight. Uh, Egyptian state television saying that those two hostages um, were at the Rafah crossing uh, from Gaza into Egypt. Uh, but the International Red Cross Agency saying that it has facilitated the release of two more hostages out of Gaza. We were talking to our Middle East correspondent a short time ago. He says he believes that they are female hostages uh, released on health grounds by Hamas tonight. Uh, more on that as we get it. So to come on the UK tonight, a pressure on the police as a man escapes arrest despite chanting jihad at a rally in London. We'll talk about why. And as the government delays the ban on no-fault evictions, we'll bring you Laz's story. She is one of hundreds of thousands of people stuck in a hidden homelessness crisis.
The government has been accused of betraying renters after delaying the ban on no-fault evictions until changes are made to the legal system. Section 21 evictions, as they're known, mean that a landlord can evict a tenant with two months' notice without having to give a reason. Well, the Conservatives first promised a ban as part of the Renters' Reform Bill in their manifesto of 2019. Speaking in the Commons, Housing Secretary Michael Gove was heckled by one of his own senior backbenchers, Edward Lee. It is in nobody's interest to allow unscrupulous landlords to continue to behave in this way, to allow vulnerable people to be rendered voiceless in this way, and to force the taxpayer to pick up the bill. The idea that abolishing Section 21 is somehow unconservative is to me, is to me absolutely nonsensical. Conservatives exist to protect the vulnerable in society, to make sure markets work and to save the taxpayer money. Well, with this delay in mind tonight, I want to bring you Laz's story. Now, Laz was evicted from her home in the summer after a long battle with her landlord. She has physical and mental health issues which affect her ability to work. However, Laz's local council has told her that she doesn't qualify for support saying she's resilient enough to cope with sleeping rough as much as anyone else is. Laz isn't alone. In fact, there's an estimated 380,000 people in this country in the exact same position. They're the hidden homeless, relying on friends and family for a roof over their head, a sofa to sleep on. And for many of them, there's no way out. I was served a Section 21 uh, in October 2022. I was meant to be evicted in January 2023, mm -hmm. and I fought it. I fought my landlords. They were looking to increase the rent by £450 a month, mm -hmm. and they went through to the courts, and we got an eviction order, order of possession uh, in May, June time, mm -hmm. uh, and I became homeless in July. And you couldn't afford anywhere else in the, in the private rental sector in the town where you live? Absolutely not. Um, I was paying you know, £615 a month um, for this property. Um, that's without bills. However, everywhere in this area has gone up and you cannot find a place for less than £1,000, £1,200. Um, so although I understand why the landlords wanted more money, mm -hmm. it has left us unable to afford that flat, let alone anywhere else in the area. We were told to visit Citizens Advice. Mm -hmm. um, First port of call. Absolutely. So local library, Citizens Advice, and they went through an income and expenditure form mm -hmm. and basically said, nope, you are right, uh, you can't afford it, go to the council. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I go to the council. Um, I'm told not eligible for social housing and I'm not eligible for emergency housing. Now this is despite Inform informing the council of my health conditions. I'm also under the Mental Health Act. Um, and, and having a really difficult time. Mm. I went into crisis. Um, I, w I was put under the crisis team in December 2022. Because you were having suicidal thoughts because Absolutely. of what was happening to you? Because I planned my suicide. That's the, the genuine, that's the genuine impact on here. They've then contacted me and said, why do you think you're, you're in priority need? Why do you need this emergency housing? Um, so I stated kind of um, the, the ailments that I do have, mm -hmm. the situation that I was in over email, only to receive a letter back saying that I was not in priority need and saying some really uncalled for things. Yeah, I've got the letter here and I just wanted to read this bit out because this bit really struck me and I, I, I want to know how you felt when you read it. It says, looking at all the facts, I believe that you are resilient enough to manage with a reasonable level of functionality and I'm not satisfied that your ability to manage being homeless, even if that homelessness were to result in you having to sleep rough occasionally or in the longer term, would deteriorate to a level where the harm you are likely to experience would be outside of the range of vulnerability that an ordinary person would experience if they were to be in the same situation as you. Yeah, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard to read. Essentially, that's saying you can cope with sleeping rough yeah. occasionally or in the longer term, 
as well as anyone else, implying that anyone, any ordinary person without any ailments can cope with sleeping rough. I, I, you know, I, it stopped me in my tracks, that paragraph. How did you feel when you read that? Um, for me, it's the, the recognition in that letter of uh, you know, what I go through, the mental health act, the, the physical things, they do refer to an ordinary person mm. and I can cope as well as an ordinary... You're resilient enough for sleep. What does that even mean? To be sleeping here tonight. To be we're, sleeping we're, here. We're, we're standing by a bench. The fact of the matter is, lads, you know, people, families are going to be going what you, you're going through. They're priced out of private. They don't check all the boxes to get help from their local council. Mm. There's essentially a hidden homelessness crisis at the moment, particularly with the cost of living. What do you do now? A lot of people have come around and offered sofas and, and sofa surfing, but not knowing where you're going to put your things at night, whether they're going to be during the day, living out of three bags and a suitcase, lugging them around in the condition that I'm in. It's awful the stress and anxiety that it puts on you on top of everything else you know Laz how old are you I'm 28 <sighs> did you ever think you'd find yourself in this position because again I'm just thinking of stories like yours that we hear young men women people with young families yeah. who find themselves in this who find themselves in this position quickly this will happen to you inside the space of a year so yeah. six months a year six months a year never i was doing multiple jobs so i was had a full-time job and your side jobs i work hard to keep a roof over my head i've always done what i needed to do to keep myself in a home i never saw this happening to me and especially not so quickly and then when it does it just knocks you for six so laz what does the I don't want to say long term, but even the medium term future look like for you. How do you get out of this? Can you get out of this? I don't see a way. I genuinely do not see a way. I will fight as much as I can. And I will talk about my situation as much as I can. Not for me, but to highlight that it's not just happening to me. It's happening to a lot of people. Um, but most people are too ashamed to speak about it. You know, as soon as you say the word homeless, the, people, the way people look at you is just different. So I will fight as much as I have to. And do you know what? Fair play to Fairham Council. I am resilient, but I shouldn't have to be. And I shouldn't have to be to this point. Well, we did ask Fairham Council to speak to us about Laz's case and the wider issues that it raises. They declined and said that they couldn't comment on individual cases, but they did give us a statement which reads, specific groups specified in law that are experiencing homelessness are provided with emergency accommodation by the Housing Authority. In cases where households do not meet the requirements for this protection, a dedicated housing officer will provide advice to help homeless households without children to secure their own emergency accommodation with friends, family, or through charitable accommodation. Applicants that do not agree with the decisions made by the Housing Authority have a legal right to request a review. Well, Laz has requested a review of her case, which is ongoing, but her story tonight will resonate with so many people. When you think of homelessness, you may well automatically think of rough sleeping, but in this current housing crisis and tough rental market, the number of young families and young people like Laz, sofa surfing or relying on friends and families is a growing issue. Struggling to afford private rents, but not struggling enough to qualify for support. That's hundreds of thousands of people caught in cycles of financial and social hardship that can be impossible to break. Well, if you've been affected by anything in that story, you can call the Samaritans on 116 123, or you can email joe at samaritans.org. Now, Rishi Sunak says police are unlikely to be given more powers after a man escaped arrest uh, chanting jihad uh, during a pro-Palestinian rally in London. Police officers say that no offences were identified, but the head of the Metropolitan Police said laws may need to be changed, although Sir Mark Rowley pointed out that it is the job of Parliament, not the police. Our crime correspondent Martin Brunt has this report. Jihad! 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 
The chant that seemed to crystallise the debate, jihad, a word that means different things to different people, from struggle to holy war. For some government ministers, it was a step too far. To the police, it wasn't a crime. After a meeting with the Home Secretary, Britain's top cop didn't appear to have changed his view. I was explaining how we are absolutely ruthless in tackling anybody who puts their foot over the legal line. We're accountable for law, we can't enforce taste or decency, but we can enforce the law. It was the law that needed changing, he said. The law that we've designed around hate crime and terrorism over recent decades hasn't taken full account of the ability of extremist groups to steer around those laws and propagate some pretty toxic messages through social media. And those lines probably need redrawing. It's a really difficult thing to do. It wasn't clear if new laws on extremists were being considered. No word from the Home Office, but the Prime Minister's official spokesperson said police already had extensive powers. If anything was needed, they said, it was clarity on how to use those powers. To learn the lessons and ensure that... Rishi Sunak spoke in the Commons. Calls for jihad on our streets are not only a threat to the Jewish community, but to our democratic values. And we expect the police to take all necessary action to tackle extremism head on. The commissioner said these were unprecedented times. Hostile state actions, 500 ongoing Islamist terror plots, and now a huge rise in hate crime. A 13-fold increase in anti-Semitic attacks, he said, and three times as many Islamophobic incidents. New laws on demonstrators were brought in last year. They were condemned then by civil rights campaigners who fear more restrictions on public protest. My concern is that the way in which the law has been um, reformed is um, having massive incursions on people's right to freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Free, free Palestine! Free. This tube train driver's message to his passengers is unlikely to get him arrested, but he might lose his job. He's been suspended. Martin Brunt, Sky News. Uh, well, let's speak to Dal Babu now, a former chief superintendent in the Metropolitan Police. Uh, Dal, good to see you uh, this evening. Good evening, Sergeant. Um, your thoughts on what's unfolded over the last 24 hours? A man shouting jihad at a protest, police not taking action because they didn't see him as having committed an offence. What was your take on it? Well, I think the, the police have done an extraordinarily good job in uh, dealing with the law as it stands. Uh, jihad has many meanings. Uh, the police have had the Crown Prosecution Service uh, working alongside with them, in, in some ways in an unprecedented way, because the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, make the decision whether somebody's charged. And they listen to what's been said, they look at the evidence as it happens, and then advise the police on whether there's likelihood to be a charge. The police can't act on legislation that doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I think we, we need to give credit to the, the police for policing these demonstrations in an even-handed way and in a way that uh, adheres to the law. Yeah, Dal, we do seem to be in, a, in an odd position where the Home Secretary and the government are asking the police to, to be tough on inciting violence, on, on hate speech, on anything like that. But the police saying, look, they're doing what they can. As you said, the law isn't there to support them. It's almost like they're being asked to use discretion and provide context and of course the law doesn't work like that it is very black and white so and then the government is saying that they're not actually going to toughen up the law so what happens next because these kind of protests and these kind of issues are going to keep coming up you're absolutely right and and, and uh, unfortunately they may actually become more vigorous uh, we, we believe that the actions will continue in the middle east and that will lead to more protests whether it's from uh, uh, people supporting uh, the Palestine, uh, Gaza, or whether it's people supporting uh, Israel, the state of Israel. So that will continue. I think what is worrying is that politicians are intervening in policing operational decisions. And after this meeting, the police will carry on doing what they've done previously, which was doing a good job. It's not particularly helpful having politicians intervening and demanding that certain action is taken 
when there isn't the legal framework to do so. When, when you, these are complex situations. I, I've been in many public order situations, uh, and I can give an overview to my officers, but the officers themselves will be responsible for the action that they take, and they will want to take action that is within the law. And I think, as I've said before, I think the police need to be given credit for dealing with these difficult demonstrations where there's a huge amount of emotion on different sides in an even-handed way, and they need to continue to do so. Dal, thank you. Dal Babu, always good to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us on The UK tonight. Thank you. As still to come, we'll take a look at the sports news as Old Trafford prepares for an emotional return to Champions League action following the death of Sir Bobby Charlton. Going on. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. This is what makes the job so fantastic. In Zaman Rashid and I'm Sky's North of England correspondent telling stories from this culturally rich region I call home. It's going to become very similar to other places and lose its unique qualities. It's steeped in history. If the Taliban found your family, what would happen? I think they're just going to straight away execute them. There are issues of racism in all levels of cricket. I was on the balcony a couple of times. I was nearly gone. Football is a joy to watch. And uh, when people are disappointed, you can feel the hate. I just felt physically sick, so I was like, that, that's really in my system. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. Even before the pandemic, GPs were pleading for help. Government expects more face-to-face -face contact with patients in return. Men, they want to force you doing something which you don't want to do. Just because you're homeless and you're looking for a warm place to sleep. We give a voice to communities often unheard and unserved from a region with a distinct history and global impact. Uh, coming up, we'll tell you why Nicola Sturgeon is celebrating uh, this evening. Uh, that's on the way. But first, uh, Jess Crichton is here with the sport. Um, and Jess, I was away over the weekend and trying to stay off social media. But I switched on and saw the extremely sad news about Sir Bobby Charlton and just had to go through all the tributes because he was so loved not just at Manchester United, but the wider sport and beyond. He really was. Um, Such an icon. An icon, uh, a real legend of the sport. And I think that's why the football world is still to this day mourning mm. the loss of Sir Bobby Charlton. Mm. Um, the manager Man at Manchester United, Eric Ten Hag, has been speaking about him recently in his press conference today, saying that he drove high standards. And those very standards that Sir Bobby set all those years ago, all those decades ago, mm. he hopes to emulate with the club now uh, in terms of driving them forward. Mm -hmm. As you rightly say, this is a man that not only was popular and famous in England and the UK, but worldwide, everyone mm. knew who he was. He achieved so much during his playing career, of course, winning uh, the European Cup with Manchester United in 1968. And who can forget about England winning the World Cup in 1966 uh, as well? It's a man that transcended the sport. It's very much a case where the world is still mourning uh, his death and paying their respects. We do know as well that Manchester United uh, are playing in the Champions League tomorrow and they will be uh, laying a wreath on his seat to pay their respects to him tomorrow. We'll speak about more of that coming up in the bulletin. 
This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people, more active. Live life with Vitality. At what point, when you were younger, did you realise that Anguilla didn't have an Olympic team and that it had to be GB who you competed for? So it's like when I got about 15, 14, 15, and I think Shara Brockham made the switch back then. I remember when Shara used to come back home and I was asking her, like, um, what, what was the reason you had to switch, you know? And she explained to me, and then I asked the people from the Federation about why is it we don't have an IOC, we're, why we are not a part of the IOC, and they broke it down to me, and I, I got an understanding for it. And then I was like, oh, and if, so for, for me to go to the Olympics, Eventually, I'd have to stop competing for Angola and then join um, Team GB. So I remember 2015, the process started, and um, I got clearance to compete for GB in, I think, the late June. And that's when I made the switch. That's quite a young age, I guess, to learn about like colonialism and like yeah. the history of the Caribbean and Britain's impact on the Caribbean, right? So what was that process like for you? Well, we always knew about um, Angola having to be a part of Britain. Um, it was something that was taught almost in, in primary school. So I, I had an idea of what was going on. But the whole idea of me switching um, the countries was something I didn't understand as much. So I had to find a lot of information out for myself. And me finding out this information at 15, 16 was, <laughs> wasn't ideal. It was quite difficult to really so keen and have an understanding. And then talk me through the process of when you actually made the switch to Great Britain, what was it like? I remember when it came out that I was making the switch now. It wasn't received as good. She's, um, here are my little 18 year old guy running super fast and keeping up with Usain Bolt, just competed against him in New York and almost beaten him. Um, I don't know if anyone else was running like super fast back there. And um, they saw that I was making a switch, so I, I started to see a bit of difference. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. And uh, right now, time for a look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, it's going to be unsettled this week. Spells of rain followed by brighter, showery conditions. Many places fine for this evening, but there will be rain from Northern Ireland through to Cornwall and also across the southeast. That's going to spread across central and southern Britain tonight, with a few showers following to southern parts later. To the west, Northern Ireland can expect showers throughout, while Ireland will see rain in the north and east, giving way to a few showery outbreaks. Scotland, mostly fine, but you can expect some showers in the east. Uh, the clear at Karma Northwest is going to turn frosty in places, while some fog is likely in the south. Northern England, mostly cloudy with outbreaks of rain tomorrow morning, while other parts will have sunny spells and a scattering of showers. Those showers concentrated over Channel, southwestern and Irish sea coasts, fairly isolated elsewhere. Temperatures much like today's. Northern England is going to dry up from the west later, while the southwest will turn wet. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, as always, we'd like to uh, leave you with something weird and wonderful from around the UK. And uh, let's face it, it has been a tough year for the former First Minister of Scotland. But finally, Nicola Sturgeon has something to smile about. Uh, today, she has celebrated passing her driving test at the very first attempt. Uh, she announced the news on Instagram, saying, I couldn't have done it without my brilliant instructor, Andy. The whole experience has taken me well out of any notion of a comfort zone, but hopefully proves that it's never too late in life to do something new. Instructor Andy shared the news on his Facebook page, writing, an average Monday, first attempt, driving test pass with just one single driver fault. Uh, well done, Nicola. So Nicola Sturgeon passing her driving test for the first time of asking. Uh, well, that's all from the UK tonight. You can, of course, catch up on all the highlights on our webpage. Just scan the QR code on your screen. You can share your thoughts with us as well. We'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs>